Okay. So, where is this? Aha. So this week, <laughs> now that we actually got the lecture portion, uh, we went through the review of what we did last week. Um, we're going to be going into what are called branching statements and logical operators. So these are uh, better known as if statements and if else statements. Uh, in addition to, I would really like to get to the while loops. Um, you guys actually use loops in the first week of class. So as part of the, like, the Minecraft exercises, like repeating things over and over again, you need to be able to do that to make games. Like it's like nearly impossible to make a game without some loops in there somewhere. So understanding how loops work is really important. In fact, programs, per, uh, computers are very good at loops. They're very efficient at running things over and over again. In fact, loops are important if you want to do anything more than like, I don't know, five times. Um, let's talk a little bit about, well, so these, this is review. This is not, that's the lab. Right, wrong power, ignore the man behind the curtain. <laughs> okay. That's the one. I have two PowerPoints, one for our lab and one for our uh, lecture. There we go. Okay. So, um, we're going to be learning about if statements. We're also going to be learning about something called a switch statement. A uh, switch statement is just kind of like a, a simpler way to write a really long if statement. We use both interchangeably, while loops. Uh, we're not going to get to uh, anything past while loops today. So this is actually kind of like almost the last part of chapter two, but um, it's like 80% of what chapter two has. Um, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about what uh, C++ considers uh, true and false values. So a lot of things in game development rely on uh, what is called a Boolean variable type. So this means a variable type that represents either something being true or something being false. Unlike the real world where no, everything's not black and white, like to a computer, most things are black and white. Like most things are either yes or no. So things are like the player is dead or is not dead, right? Those are things. Uh, are you level six or are you not level six, right? Do you have this weapon equipped or not? Like, a lot of these things break down to is this statement true or false? Uh, it comes down to these, uh, you can see these relational operators here, which I'll get to in a second, too. Um, a little bit of a refresher, like if you don't remember what a bool variable looks like, oops. a bool variable is Something like that. So these things are either true or false. Bool is named after some guy named Bool with an E. I, I wish I knew more about the history of that. There's a, for me, the entire life has been, Bool just has been burned into my brain that it means true or false. Uh, another way that Bools are used is not just in variables to represent something being true or false, but in a way to compare things. So here, Here are some uh, different operators called relational operators in C++ and some of the, uh, the samples of what kinds of things you would use them for. So let's go through this list real quick and try to figure out what the answers to these are. And every single one of these is basically true or false. You guys ever do uh, logic puzzles? God, I don't even know. Like, there's like these weird puzzles where it's almost like Picross. You know, you know, does anyone know what Picross is? Mm -hmm. It's like the DS game where you like Mario awesome. Picross kind of thing where you chip away. Yeah. Um, or it's kind of like a, it looks kind of like a crossword puzzle and you have to say like, oh, Jane lives next to Bob, but Bob is adjacent from Jill. And Jill lives in the blue house, but Jeremy lives in the red house. The red house is next oh, to the blue house. Um, Jill and Bob can see each other. You know, these things, like all these rules about explaining the situation, you have to figure out like, was Jill next to Bob or is Jill like on the other side of the street from Bob. Like these weird puzzles like that, you get a bunch of rules like explaining what the situation is, you have to kind of like figure it out. Um, those are the kinds of examples of logic puzzles. So I just kind of want to go through here and figure out what the results of these operations would be. So these are all going to be true or false, and these operators on the left are exactly how you write them in uh, C++. So the first one is the equality operator. It means is this, if the left side, is the left side of this equal to the right side of this? So five, is five equal to five? True. Right? Is 5 equal to 8? False. False. 
the next one is an exclamation point with an equals operator in front of it, which means is the left side not equal to the right side? So what is the result of 5 not equal to 8? True. What is the, the uh, result of 5 not equal to 5? False. False. OK. You're going to confuse those, trust me, at some point. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> it's a very easy. It also gets a little like, like you see, you read the line of something like this, and you're just like, I have no idea what this is saying. I need to like break this down. Sometimes these things can get kind of long. Uh, greater than. It means it's the left side greater than the right side. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know if they teach like alligators yeah. about yeah. eating the left side. <laughs> can the right side eat the left side? Is the right side bigger than the left side? Uh, yeah, is that true or false? It's greater than five. True. Yeah. true. True. Okay. What about this one here? False, false right? Uh, opposite for the left side is five less than eight. True. What about this one here? Okay. Greater than or equal to. True. So this one says it can be, it has to be uh, either greater than or it can also be equal to. It's kind of a combination between this one and this one. It combines both of those. Okay. Um, eight is greater than or equal to five. True. Five is less than or equal to eight. False. And the opposite would be pretty self explanatory, right? All right. Uh, you use these a lot in if statements. So let's, let's talk about those a little bit. So if you weren't sure, the answers are there. Um, this is the book. You can use what's called an if statement. So this is the first time that you might have seen this in C++. It's a way to test to see if an expression is true or not. And if it is true, then go ahead and run the statement that's below it. So this is a way to control how your program runs. Up to now, your program has always basically run top to bottom, line by line. But a lot of times, you don't want it to run some lines of code. You want to skip over some lines of code. Right? Examples of this are like, um, I got experience points. If I got enough experience points to gain a level, increase my level by one. You don't want that. You don't want to increase your level by one every time. You only want to do it if you got enough experience to get a level. What about uh, taking damage is another one, right? Let's say you were writing something that says, hey, uh, write some code that says uh, you took some damage, and then you die if you're below zero health or equal to zero health. So in this case, you would want an if statement that says, hey, if my health is less than or equal to zero, go ahead and kill the player. But you don't want that running every time. You don't want to kill the player every time they take damage. So you're going to basically write a bunch of code that runs, and then it's going to skip over uh, that statement if the expression doesn't turn true. This statement here can be more than a single line of code, though. This can also be what's called the block of code. So you guys have been writing a block of code, the curly braces inside main. Remember how I talked about block of code is basically what's in between the curly braces? So this return is a block of code. This whole thing is one block of code. If you write an if statement with some expression in it, and you had a statement here, this can be replaced. It's not a valid thing. If you want to, you can put it inside curly braces, and it'll write everything inside of here. And this is where you put your expression, like it's 5 less than 8. So I'm going to write my code. Maybe I'll do this. Okay. What will the output of my program be? Definitely say hello. Will it also say game over here? We went over this. What is, is five less than eight? Yes. Okay. If that statement is true inside the parentheses, it will run the next block of code. So I will see hello and then game over. That is what the result of this will be. I'm going to go over this in more. Just. We're just going to do this one, one at a time. 
This is hello, game over. All right. What if I flip it? What is the output of this going to be? Yeah, it'll just say hello. Right? It's not going to run this code. So if I run this now, I just flip the, I just flip that thing. The alligator is now the eight's trying to eat the five. The five is not greater than eight, so it doesn't write that. Okay. Let me show you this in a little bit more detail. I'm going to use the Visual Studio debugger here. So I'm going to go back to what it was before. I'll put what's called a breakpoint here. Okay. So there's hello. You see the yellow arrow on the left. I'm going to go through the line of code. Okay. It's about to run the if statement. That's where the yellow arrow is. I'm going to run more, one more line of code. Cool. It jumped in there. Now it's running that. Okay. If I flip this, watch what happens to that yellow arrow now when I run this. So I'm going to run that line of code, same as but usual. I'm about to evaluate the if statement. Where is it going to jump to instead? The bottom. Right there. See how it jumped over that code? It branched. It's kind of like a branching storyline, I guess, in like, uh, in like Mass Effect or like any of the... Uh, I don't know if Fallout has multiple endings. Does Fallout have multiple endings? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Depending yeah. on your choices, you go down different paths for the story. Yeah. Imagine this program is our story. Hello, game over. Best, best game, 2016 by IGN. <laughs> 10 out of 10. Uh, easy to play. Yeah, easy to play. Accessible. Succinct. Really to the point. Pure is what they would call it. Yeah. DLC is coming later. <laughs> Oh, I'd be able to download that and for it. So that's important, though. It, it didn't even go in here. It just jumped over that. Did you guys see that? I'll run this again. So watch the yellow arrow. So there's the yellow arrow inside my circle. I can get rid of the circle for now. I'm just going to run one line of code. Cool. I ran hello. If I, run, if I bring this up, it actually says hello over here. Okay. I'm going to run one more line of code. Bam. It jumped down to there. skipped over that entirely. As opposed to flipping this. Okay, run one line of code. Now that if statement is evaluating to be true, which means it's going to jump in there. See how it jumped inside there now? Now it's actually running that code. It's running this block. So I can put anything I want to in between these curly braces and it'll run. questions on this. It's really common for you guys to want to put a semicolon here. That would be a mistake. Notice there's no semicolon here. If you guys put a semicolon here, I guarantee you'll get wrong results. So there are a few things you need to put semicolons on. You need to put semicolons on most things. I think it's easier to remember what you don't need semicolons on than it is the other way around. Never put a semicolon at the end of an if statement. That is never a correct thing. You don't ever have logic that would work like that. This if statement is meant to run and then run the code. If you put a semicolon at the end of that, you know what it does? It'll say, if this thing is true, then run this block of code. And the block of code that's running is literally as if you did that. That is your line. It'll, it'll run that semicolon. You know why that's a problem? Is because if, so notice here, this says, hello, game over, cool. Right? And if I ran the other program, if I flip this, it only says, hello, right? Watch what happens when I put a semicolon here, though. Right there. Looks innocuous enough, right? What is my result? It printed that game over. You know why? Because it thought it needed to do that. That is basically what you're telling it to do. And that is legal. You're allowed to write that. That is a compiled success. You can write that block of code. <laughs> that is essentially what you're doing when you put a semicolon at the end of an if statement. And then it goes and it's all happy. Here, I'll put a breakpoint in here just to prove the point. It's happy enough to uh, run everything else after that. So hello. Sorry, I got to uh, put a breakpoint here instead. So step. It stepped completely over the if statement, and it jumped right inside there. Because I have curly braces here with nothing in front of it. Why was it you don't put the curly braces? Did you get errors? Here? Well, I 
Oh, you mean like this? Like that? You're allowed to do that, but only for one line. The reason why this is, I never do this, our coding standard is to never do this, because this is legal. I know the book teaches it. This looks like it should work, right? Like, if I greater than eight, I'm gonna run this line, I'm gonna run the next line. That's actually not what's happening. Because the block of code is defined by what's in between curly braces. If you do not have curly braces around your block of code, it only treats your block of code as one line. So this thing has no curly braces. The block of code that this if statement runs is one line after it. So what ends up happening is it more runs like this. This, this the right here is the same as if I did this. It basically only runs that one line. But if you have stuff in curly braces, it'll run everything in between the curly braces. Oh. It's basically, curly braces are a way to package up and say, hey, everything in this is part of one big party. Like, you're like grouping up, and everything inside the curly braces wants to run together. But if you put stuff without curly braces, it only knows, like, oh, I guess you're a party of one. So going back to PowerPoint, if that expression is true, run the statement. A statement is either a single line or it's multiple lines in between curly braces. Those are two options you have. If you have two lines with no curly braces, that's not, that's not a, a single statement. That's two statements. All right, so let me show you guys the, uh, the example. I feel like we're not going to have time to do the lab work. So I'm just going to have to go through this and show it to you. Does that make sense so far, the if statement? Like you choose, if that statement is true, you run the line of code after it? <laughs> yeah, you guys just need to work on it. Here's some more examples. You can also have a statement that's literally the word true. So if this thing is true, then run this line of code. Is that expression true or false? True, true, <laughs> right? Is this one true or false? False. So will it run this line of code? No. No. And you type in a word like that. By the way, you would never write if statements like this. That's just for example. That's just, this is like the most worthless if statement ever. You might as well not have written this line of code. However, there is one case that you might do this, um, and I've done this on occasion, where I will have some really long expression like uh, did player level. Up. Uh, we're going to get into these later, but if I had some more stuff, we could, you can combine them. Uh, did is player dead and other things I care about, and there is even more things, just more and more crap that I would put there. I'm like, man, I don't want to like write all this. I will do this. I'll comment that out, and I'll do true. If I'm, let's say I'm trying to debug a problem and I'm not sure why something's happening and I want something to happen every time, I don't want to care about if I leveled up or if the player is dead, I will just literally write true in front of there and just have it run. Another way you can do this is you can, uh, you can just comment out this entire line here. So if you just do this, that's the same thing. That's exactly the same as that. So this, this, and this, give the same exact result every time. That if true statement might as well not be there. In fact, I bet you C++ secretly removes that and just deletes it. That's the same also as if doing this. And this is also the same as doing this. Those curly braces don't do anything. They, the curly braces are kind of a way to like group things together. It's you know, It's for organization. It also tells C++ that I want these things to run together. So you can put curly braces here. You can also put empty curly braces if you want to, but nothing in them. They don't do anything. Again, they're, they're up to you to use, right? But curly braces are important for if statements. So if you want to run multiple things like that, those will all run together. However, same thing for here. Oops. 
curly braces are a way to make sure that everything inside the block of curly braces will, will not be displayed. So do they use that? Like, if it's, like, in, in WoW, you know, mm -hmm. like, someone dies, they got to do, like, resurrection and sit Yeah, they got to do. That's, is that, like, their true statement? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, like, hey, um, like, I, I got res, and I have res sickness, right? I res at the graveyard or whatever. Um, there might be an if statement somewhere that says, hey, as long as I'm currently under res sickness, like lower my HP and lower my stats. Um, this thing here, like what you could, what you normally have happen, let's say like if, let's say I have a Boolean variable that says, hey, player is dead, <coughs> equals true. You might have a bunch of line of codes here that are like, oh, um, make player health equals to zero, player uh, res timer equals 10, 10 seconds. So you could have that. So this thing is, is an example of running a block of code. There's a lot of ways you can write an if statement. I'm about to get to more of them, but I just want to show you that blocks of code are important for writing your if statements. All right, so I'm going to undo all this, go back to what it was. OK, let's get into using variables here a little bit. Again, remember, there's no semicolon here. OK, so C++ will also let you take a variable and just shove it in there and evaluate it <coughs> true or false. This is kind of the weird part. If I said, hey, is 72 true? Or is 6,000 true? What would you say to me? Say, crazy, what are you going to smoke in? Uh, <laughs> why is so is 1,000 true or false? As I said, C++ views everything in black and white. Well, here's the key. Numbers also represent true or false in C++. In C++, the number 0 is the universal value for false. You, gotta kind of, you just have to kind of remember that. 0 means false. It means nothing. It means I don't have a value. It's false. Anything other than 0 is true. Okay? Even Any, negatives. Even negatives. Anything other than zero is true. Because C++ will automatically convert that to a number, and then or convert that to a bool. So we'll say, hey, is this thing zero? Ah, it's not. All right, it's true. Go ahead. You're, you're free to go. <laughs> so this case here, is this true or false? If score, it's true. It's weird, right? It's an integer. They're like, is, an, is 1,000 true? <laughs> So any non-zero value will be true, while zero will be represented as false. At least you didn't score zero, is what that says. So no matter what your score is, if it's not zero, you'll run that. Uh, why is this important? Well, we use this a lot. So one of the most common things you write as an if statement is to see whether something exists or not. Like, let's say you're locking onto something. Um, let's say you're playing like a Devil May Cry or like a Zelda or a any, any game that has like a lock-on system, and I'm locking on to uh, a thing or a player. Let's say I'm playing GTA or I'm playing uh, The Division, maybe. And I have someone in my sights so that's like a homing missile or something, and it's tracking that guy, right? And that guy disconnects, and he pops out of the world, disappears, or something else happens to the enemy to make him disappear and get the street to destroy. If statements lie to see if that guy exists or not just by looking at uh, that guy's variable. So uh, for those of you guys that are in um, more advanced point, th this is where you could compare a pointer. So pointers by default start at zero. If you initialize them to null, if they're not null, then they're true. So if statements can be used to say, hey, if I have a target, then go ahead and run my code. Uh, everything gets converted to either true or false. If you, do an if, if you do something like this, you can stick any variable in here. It could be an integer. It could be a double. It could be a float. Be a bool, be a string, and that if statement will evaluate true or false based on whether that thing turns into zero or not. All right. Some of the more common things that you do are if statements comparing values to one another. So this is kind of uh, building on what we had in the previous table. If score is greater than or equal to 250, now you kind of have to do the mental replacement in your head. What was score here? So it's a thousand, right? So you got to mentally swap out what that variable says for the actual value of what score is. So it's going to actually be if 1,000 is greater than or equal to 250, 
So you gotta do this in your head. Now you know that that's true, right? Any questions on that? Simple stuff, hopefully. If you run this code, and it's more than that, or since they're all one greater than or thousands greater than all of those, or equal to all of those, does it display all of those? Uh, yes, it does. If I typed 100 here, what would it display? This one, and then it wouldn't display any of the others, right? Because it's not greater than uh, any of those other numbers. So here, let me get into the next one. Oh yeah, and don't confuse this with this. Like there's no such thing as that. It's either this or it's this, two equals. So there's a difference here. This is true, right? We know that 1,000 greater than or equal to 250. What about this? That's false, yeah. right? What about this? Is that true? Yes. That's true, right? What about this? No. That's false, right? Because 1,000 is not greater than 1,000. Think back to uh, grade school, like, bigger numbers, hopefully. Um, you have to pass everything that that operator compares. Yeah. Aha, and here's one more thing too. It's, uh, it's pretty, uh, if I just do this, right? We know that that's true, right? Because it's equal to 1,000. Here's something that is, uh, even people that have been programming for years and years and years run into this kind of pitfall which is you'll, you'll write this code and you'll accidentally leave out one of the equal signs. What does that mean when I leave out an equal sign? What does that equals actually do? You guys did this. It sets score equal to a value, right? But I'm putting it inside an if statement. Well, here, let me change this to 500. Okay, so is this true? No, no right, because 500 is not equal to 1,000. What happens when I do this? It doesn't change the value for score. It does change the value for score. It makes it equal to 1,000. And then it evaluates score. Then it does this. It's the equivalent of that. And what would that be? That'd be true, right? Because we said anything non-zero is true. 500 or 1,000, this would turn into 1,000. This is setting score equal to 1,000. <coughs> And then that if statement's like, cool, man, you said it equal to 1,000. I'm going to go ahead and see if that's true or not. <laughs> Whatever that means to you. Looks like 1,000 turns out to be true. All right, I'm going to go ahead and run this code right here. And what that means is that even though you said you get a double whammy, this thing you want it to be 500, but now you just blew it away. And you said, no, no, it's 1,000. And you're running this code when you didn't want to. This is very different than if you were to add one little equal sign there. Okay. This is something that will trip you guys up. Make sure that you're using double equals operators as opposed to a single one. Okay, remember how I talked about curly braces? It runs everything inside the curly braces. Well, here's an example of curly braces. If I just do this. This is our if statement right here. And it runs some code inside curly braces. I'm just going to hide this for now, just to make it a little bit easier. So this is what it runs inside the curly braces. Notice it prints out something, and then, oh, there's another if statement here, right? It, this first if statement runs everything inside the curly brace, including other if statements. When you write a statement like this inside of a bigger one like this, it's called nesting. When you, it's kind of like, you know, like the term for nesting. You put something smaller inside something bigger, right? This if statement comes here. <coughs> It'll run everything inside here. It runs this line of code, and then, oh, there's another if statement here. Then this thing will run this line of code. And you can infinitely nest. Uh, not infinitely, there is actually a limit. Like for us, we try not to nest more than seven times. But you could do, you could keep this going.
That's a quadruple nesting? No, single, double, triple, single, double, triple nested if statement. This is not really uh, great code, but you can do this. So what is the order that this thing will do? So because score is greater than or equal to 500, it runs this line of code, then it runs the next, and it'll keep going until I'm done. So let me, let me show you what this looks like when I, uh, when I put a breakpoint here. I'm going to put a breakpoint right at the top here. So we're just going to step through this whole thing one line at a time to make sure you guys see what's happening. All right, so where's that yellow arrow going to go? Which line number is it going to go to? 11. 11, right? So I'm going to step, goes to 11. <laughs> cool. I'm going to step one more time. Where's this line number going to go? 19. Yeah, basically 19. It's actually going to jump to 21. Uh, oh, this one actually jumped. Oh, because I have an assignment. If you actually do this, it'll skip over it. But yeah, so there it is, 19. Okay. Next is there. So where will it jump to now? 26. 26? Yep. Okay. And then 28? No? Oh, because it's 500. Okay, score 250 or more. Oh, because we changed this code. Never mind. Okay, where does it jump to now? Score is currently 500. Goes to 33, right? And then it goes to here. Is that statement true or false? Score is currently 500. Okay, so it's going to go all the way down to the bottom. Okay. So let's change score. Let's get let's get score to be something a little bit more. Uh, let me change this. Let's make score like I don't know three thousand. And let's do this again. I'm going to start here this time. Score is equal to a thousand. It will skip over that, so it does not go to line twenty three. Here it goes to line twenty eight. Okay. This goes to line thirty three as it did before. <coughs> okay. Where does this go now? 37. Cool. Print out that. And then 37, I continued. And then there's nothing else that it does. I don't print out anything here. It actually did run that, but uh, it ran this one here, but did not run this one. All right, that's nesting. Okay. You can nest as much as you want. Uh, the reason why you would do nesting is that sometimes, even though you know that this is true, there might be a bunch of other things you care about, like, OK, um, the player gained a level. Cool. I know that the player gained a level, so I want to run this code. Let's say this is um, 33 was a line of code where I want to do stuff when they level. Maybe now I care about more than whether they level or not. Now I also care whether uh, what class they are, right? Maybe the way they, what they get when they level changes based on what class you are. Like, you get talent points and stuff. Or maybe I want to know, hey, you leveled up, but are you on a multiple of 10? because you get talent points every 10 points, or 10 levels, you would write nested if statements for that. Questions? All right. Next. If else. This is also really common. Sometimes you care if something is true, but you care just as much when that statement is not true. But you do care about both of those cases. So an if-else statement lets you basically not only handle what happens if something is true, but if that thing is not true, you'll be able to do something special in that case, too. So in this case, if this thing is true, it'll run statement 1. And it skips statement 2. It'll only run statement one. If this thing is false, it will not run statement one. It will actually jump down to statement two. It's kind of like English. If the player leveled up, then do this kind of thing. Give him a talent point. Else, just give him experience like normal. Another way to do it is that, um, hey, man, if you go to McDonald's, can you pick me up a Big Mac? But otherwise, just get me a Coke, right? It's just like wherever else you go, I don't care, but just get me a Coke. If you're not going to go to McDonald's, I, don't, I only want a Big Mac. I don't 
Or if you're not going to go McDonald's or something else. Um, yeah, it's weird, right? Like, why would you not eat too? But like, you don't know where they're going to go. It's like maybe your roommate or whatever is like going out for food, and you're like, hey man, can you pick me up something? But only if you're going to go to McDonald's. <laughs> Otherwise, like, I don't want anything else. I only eat McDonald's. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, you get the idea, though. It's kind of weird, but at least you get, you have those rules. Like, you're telling your roommate, hey, if you go to McDonald's, do this. Otherwise, do this other thing. Um, like, hey, if you're going to play Diablo, uh, give me a call. I want to play it with you. Otherwise, just don't, 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 don't tell me. Or, or yeah, let's go out for drinks later. Yeah, don't even bother me. <laughs> okay, so let's see an example of this in action. Similar to the if statement before, so this time we're asking for the score. If the score is greater than or equal to 1,000, we'll type this. Otherwise, we'll do this. Okay. So if I type in 500, what will I see? This. Notice the else is literally just the word else. It has no, nothing after it. No semicolon, no parentheses, or anything. That's because this is like you don't care what it is. The only thing is, if it's not true, do this. If this statement is not true, just catch everything else. Everything else goes there. So you'll always, in this case, the, the key thing to remember is that you are guaranteed to either run this line or this line. Guaranteed. It has to go down one of those rows. Like in a branching storyline, you get or any of the Walking Dead games, you have an option. You have to pick one or the other, right? It will have to run this code or this code. This is a great way to handle branching. <coughs> that if you don't like the first result, you will always be guaranteed to run the second. <coughs> So if I run this, so it's going to ask me for a number. Enter your score. If I type in 1,500, where is it going to go? What line of code will it go to here if I typed in 1,500? First line. That one, 15, right? Cool. And then where does it go after this? After it runs this. Where, where, down here? It jumps right to actually down here. It doesn't even go elsewhere. Right there. Because uh, like, remember, if you don't have a variable assignment, it jumps there. Notice it did not run this line of code here. Did not run line number 19. Cool. Let's run this again. This time, let's type in 2. So where is it going to go? 19. Nineteen. So that skipped over that if statement and went right into nineteen because I typed in two. How is this different from this? That's always the result. Yeah, this one will always run. Like, do you guys understand why this is different from the else? Yeah. You score less than a thousand. So if I type in fifteen hundred here, watch the watch the lines. A step it goes in there. Cool. That's exactly what I want. Score is greater than a thousand. Where is it going to go next? Eighteen. So it's going to run that too. But wait, that's not true, right? So this is going to run every time. So now if I look at this, see how it printed out both. You scored a thousand or more, and you scored less than a thousand. So this is the difference between this and this is that only one of these will run, right? Well, in the other case, that bottom one will always, always run. Okay. What happens if you put else in the same brackets as if? You mean in here? Like this? Well, so you just take out the, uh, the ending bracket. Here? And then the one that else has. Yeah. Like this? This is not valid, C++. Okay. You can't write it. 
And else always has to be part of the same like kind of family as an if. You basically see these all in the same like line. You see this, like this. It always has to be like that. So you always have to have an else or an if statement here before you can run an else. You know, you, they have to be within uh, separate blocks of code. They have to be two separate statements. OK. What's another way that I can write the same exact behavior without using else? What can I do here? You guys already know the answer to this. What can I write here to get the same exact behavior in my code? If score is less than 1,000. Yes, yeah. If score is less than 1,000. This is the same exact well, result. Oh, no, less than, yeah. You had it right. Because less than or equal to, I mean, if it's equal to 1,000, they would both. This right here is the same exact result as putting an else. The benefit to using an else is that you don't have to write this every time. We, we don't actually need the keyword else in C++, to be fair. Like, if they didn't include that, we could do it this way, which is just to write the opposite, right? You take what is true and you just flip it around. So what is the opposite of greater than or equal to 1,000? It's less than 1,000, right? That covers both ranges of numbers. But instead of doing this, you do this. It's the same thing. Questions? Just one. You only get one. But I'm about to show you another way that you can add more conditions. Else, this is special. This guy says, I'm going to catch everything that kind of falls out. So whatever, whatever, if, you, if you get to this point, it's like, cool, I guess, I guess I'm it. I guess I'm the chosen one. I guess I'll run my line of code. So else will actually be the one that cho chooses to run. But I'll, sh I'll show you just in like one minute how you can do more. Yeah. What if you want to see in terms of the one that's already? The one that's already? Like you want to see this one? If you always want to see that, you mean? No, no, no. If you wanted to see that. Oh, I see. Um, you change the score. So here, what what score do I need to type in to see that? You tell me. No, I'm saying like if you want, I'm saying like you want to see the top one and the bottom. Oh, you want to see both? Yes. Yeah. Well, then you don't need an if statement at all. So in this case, you you mean you're literally just writing this. That you're just you have no condition. It doesn't. It always runs that. It's actually a lot simpler if you want to do both, right? Because if you think about it, like if I step through here, I'm just going to step through and show you the yellow arrow as it goes through. So I'm going to type in score. I'm going to type in a thousand here, and see it's going to run that line 13 and line 14, right? It's just going to do both. Every time. There's no if statements there. That's basically what you guys have done last week for homework. Uh, okay. So there's if and else. OK. Let's get to the uh, final one. So you can actually chain together as many ifs as you want if you use a special else if keyword. This is the third and final part of an if statement. Once you learn these three, that's you'll never use anything else other than this for your statements. Yeah. You can only use this once. Else by itself is a special guy. You can only have one of those. Else if is a special guy that you can use as many times as you want to. <coughs> Infinitely number of times. You can have a billion lines of if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else all those things. Okay. And you guys are going to do that. That's well, so not, mean, not a billion. Not a billion, but you're going to do five. Um, so, yeah, that'll be. I'll give you guys 18 hours. Just have to write. Um, we can do a take home midterm. <laughs> no, your midterm is going to be a test, a classic test. Um, 40, 40 questions, I think, I have on this one. What? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just from the book. Coding. No. Paper. It's uh, multiple choice. <laughs> Don't worry about it. We're on like week three. Midterms are what? Like two weeks away? We learn a lot in two weeks. Uh, Should we just read all the chapters? Okay. So here's the new one. You can chain together multiple ifs and else if. 
So here's how it goes. It goes from top to bottom, and it's kind of going door to door and asking if each of the various expressions are true or false. So first thing it starts, it says, hey, is expression one true? Cool. If expression one is true, it runs statement one and only statement one. It doesn't run anything else. Basically finds its match, its soulmate in expression number one and runs statement one. And then after it's done running statement one, it's done. It gets out of that else if statement. If this is false, it starts going down the list. It starts asking, hey, is expression number two true or false? If it's true, it goes in there, does its business, gets out, and is done with that if statement. If this is false, it keeps going down the list until you have exhausted all the, all the available expressions. If none of these are true, the last thing it'll do is guarantee to run this else statement. Okay. So if all else fails, you get down to the bottom. Okay, so it goes down the list, devaluing each one in turn. Uh, this is a, per a perfect example of this is like class selection in an RPG or like race selection, right? Like which class did they pick? Did they pick an elf or did they pick a warrior, a priest, mage, summoner, whatever? <laughs> You'd have an ILSEF statement for every single one of those, right? Um, I did damage to something. Did I do fire damage? Oh, I didn't do fire damage. Did I do lightning damage? I didn't do lightning damage. Did I do ice damage? No, I didn't do any of those elemental damages. Well, I guess I just did regular damage. That would be fine. Okay. Yeah. So, like, something like that would be like if the elemental damage would be the fire. Because if the monsters make a fire, increase attack power by X amount of Yep. Yeah. Else, just do normal damage, right? Or maybe the monster is weak to fire or, um, and uh, fire and lightning, right? If the monster is weak to fire, do extra fire damage, right? But maybe the monster is not weak to fire, but he's weak to lightning. Then you jump to the next one. Yeah. Do you have how to use like the enumeration for the actual weapons that are doing that? Yep, yeah, we're going to get to, yeah, exactly. That's a good example where maybe what you're comparing is the monster's weakness, which is an enumeration. And your weapon's damage type, which is the same enumeration. You say, hey, is my weapon type equal to the monster's weakness type? That would actually be your expression. <coughs> is my weapon type equal to the monster's weakness? If it's not, then do the normal damage. OK, finally, there's a score rater 3. OK, so here is. The final if statement, if else statement. This is the one of the more. This is probably as involved as you're going to get. I'm going to show you guys one of these and then one more. So I enter a score. If I enter a thousand, what happens? Is this true? It is, right? A thousand is greater than equal to a thousand. Runs this. Where does it go after it runs line number fifteen? Where does it go after it runs line number fifteen here? Goes to 17? Uh, goes to the end right here, right? So an if else statement basically says as soon as it, one of those things is true, I'm going to enter a 1,000 here. There's a score. Runs that. And then goes all the way to the end. Okay. Notice it didn't even run it. This code might as well not have even been there. That's basically the result I got. What happens if I put in 100? Okay, where does it go after this? 17. Cool. Where does it go after this? 21. Where does it go after this? 27. Okay. You have to start building this like in-game code mini-map, right? Like you have to kind of be able to imagine line by line where your yellow arrow is going to go. It's actually kind of how I visualize how programs run. I literally have to run it. Like, I'm literally running like a simulation in my head of like this yellow arrow, you know, of like stepping through line by line. It's not a skill that you just have normally. It's something you have to like develop. And you get faster and faster at it to the point where it's like reading a book. Like, imagine you're learning like Japanese and you start reading a book, right? You have to like look up every character maybe one at a time. Like, okay, what does this character mean? Okay, what does that character mean? Eventually, you become fluent. You could read it quickly, 
there's some guys out there that are speed readers that can read just pages like this, right? They can just literally turn pages. You guys ever see those guys? Like they're like, oh yeah, I'm a speed reader. I can read a book really fast. I just do this. All right, I'm done. Like that book is read, right? They basically have like a way to parse the text on each page super quickly. And that's what you'll get to the more you read code and the more you write code. And the only way to get better at it is to do more of it. But that skill that you have is super, super important because you can't always step through everything one thing at a time. Sometimes you have to be able to read it and understand what it does because that's how you fix the errors in your code. If you have a bug in your code, you need to know how your, the, the program is going to run from top to bottom. Now, to be fair, I will, if I'm, if I'm debugging a really difficult problem, I will use a debugger and I will step through one at a time. Because when you, if you're in a position where you can't read it from top to bottom, you have to rely on Visual Studio to tell you what's actually happening. Because you might not, you might assume, oh yeah, I, I could have sworn it was going to go into this line of code. Why? Why did it do that? Well, you have to rely on Visual Studio for it. All right. Okay, do you guys want to do some exercises on this or should I keep going? I wonder. I think I'm going to have to keep going. It's not, it's not, this actually is kind of a different, it's really easy to read it, but like once you actually start writing it, it's going to be a little tricky. So I guess what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys um, the lab work as homework too. So that'll be fun. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about switch statements. Um, I'm going to preface this with saying that you could never write a switch statement in your entire career and you'd be okay. Like that, these are, uh, you, would, you, could use the, you could get the same exact results by using a uh, if statement. There are a few benefits to using switch statements that kind of make your life easier. It's kind of like, a, you know, it's like using the right tool for a job. You could uh, hand unwrap your models or you could just have something auto unwrap it for you if you wanted to. Or you could, um, you could drive a manual if you want to or you could just drive an automatic. There is basically, this is kind of like a specialized version of an if-else statement. It's a way to write one of those kind of in a more foolproof way as well as a way to write things and reuse um, behavior. So this is kind of a, this syntax here is something you're going to have to just look up. Like it's not something that's easy to remember off the top of your head. It's still, I still like, I don't write these often enough where it's like, oh yeah, it's just like, I can just write it down. I mean, I can pretty much do that, but it does take, it has a special uh, series of syntax, like it uses colons, uses a keyword called case, uses a semicolon and a break line. It has all these new things in it. So I want to just break this down and explain what each of these things do. So what a switch statement does is that it takes this value, choice, and compares it against all of these options here. And depending on which one of those options it matches, it runs a statement next to it. The caveat is that each of these values, it's actually doing a direct comparison. Like let's say, hey, I typed in a thousand here. The only operation you get to do is to see whether that value is equal to choice. So is value one equal to choice? Is value two equal to choice? Is value three equal to choice? That's all it does. You can't compare greater than or less than or equal to. So it seems a little bit limited, but it actually has some usages. Um, enumerations are a good case for this where you have a known set of values. But uh, if one of these values matches the choice, if these value and choice are equal, it'll run the statement. It'll run everything inside that statement. You remember, you can have braces there. And then if it sees the word break, it'll jump right down to here, right at the very last line. And typically, you're going to want to have a break after every statement. Otherwise, it will actually continue running whatever is on the next line. This is, this is like the weird part about switch. If I didn't have the break there, and I had this here, this value, was equal to choice, it would actually run statement one. If there was no break, it will immediately run statement two. And if there's no break here, it will immediately run statement three. It's called a fall through. It basically will keep running. It's kind of like a runaway train until you turn on the brakes. It'll run statement one, and it'll just keep running everything. It's like overzealous. It'll run everything until you tell it to break, which is why typically you have a break uh, at the end of everything. 
And another limitation to this is that choice can only be an integer. That's it. It's the only thing it can be. It can be an enumeration because enumerations are also integers. So choice can only be an integer. <coughs> I know the most common question is like, why would I use why would I use this at all? Like this seems like super limited, has a lot of pitfalls to it, like a lot of problems with it. Um, I have if else statements are basically the same thing. So it's like kind of a personal thing, but I so there's there's a technical reason why you would use this. One is very explicit to what you're comparing. Uh, this is a you can only compare integers, so you have no chance of comparing greater than or equal to or comparing floats to one another. So you're guaranteed to get the proper comparison. Uh, another benefit is that you know when I talk about that runaway train behavior, sometimes you want that behavior. Maybe uh, maybe this is a switch statement for again picking your class, right? And maybe your class determines your initial loadout. You guys ever play Dark Souls or Dark Souls yeah. 2? You know how your classes give you different starting equipment? Maybe some of the classes give you the same starting equipment as others. I don't know if there's two classes in Dark Souls that give you the same starting equipment. Let's just imagine there was, OK? You might have a switch statement that says, hey, what class did they pick? Did they pick a pyromancer? Did they pick a, a warrior or whatever, barbarian? I don't know what the priest or whatever. If you wanted to, you can set up your switch statement to basically give them inventory here. And maybe you want to have two of the same classes give the same inventory. You could omit the break statement, and that would do that. This default here is a special version of the case statement where this thing says, if none of these cases are true, run this default statement. Okay. It's like the else of an if else. All right. I'm not going to go, I'm not actually going to even show you. I'll show you, okay, I'll show you one example of this. Um, but I don't really mind if you guys don't use this. Because I feel like it's one of those things that um, you learn to use as you need it. So here's an example of what an actual switch statement looks like. Basically, that's an integer choice. That's comparing one, two, or three. Depending on what choice is, it will print out one of these things. If you typed in four or negative one, it will do this. This is something you're just going to have to look up for syntax. It's not something that's like super intuitive. In fact, it's one of the C++ structures that's like super not like any of the other structures. So that's why I don't really want to like spend a ton of time on it. But I want you guys to know that that's a switch statement. And that's a switch statement is basically an if-else statement that um, is more rigid. Oh, another thing too is that switch statements actually are faster in a lot of ways than if-else statements. The way that they internally get compiled down, depending on the size of the switch statement, sometimes this is like an order of magnitude faster to run than an if-else statement. Because the reason why is that because you're always comparing integers and you're only comparing against one thing, your computer can evaluate that way faster than doing an if-else statement. An if-else has to go one at a time to evaluate. This thing basically just does it one comparison. It does one comparison and it goes to the right place in the code, which means if you're doing something that needs, if you're, let's say you're writing something like something that has to happen a lot, often, like in Overwatch, we use switch statements um, in a variety of places just because we want speed as well as um, it makes more sense because we're using enums. This kind of thing is faster than writing for uh, if statements. So, like faster for the code. So you'll get more frames per second. Your game will run faster. You get a 10 out of 10 on IGN because they're praising your high frame rate. <laughs> you get a billion dollars in bonuses. World peace will be achieved because you got your switch statement written right. All right. All right. Okay. We have time to do loops. I'll spend the rest of the half hour talking about loops, and then I'll uh, give you guys the homework. Okay, loops. This is uh, this is why programming is like really hard. Like, up to this point, we've basically been writing like a glorified choose-your-own-adventure game. Loops. This this is now about to open the door to like how you make games. Everything in games runs on loops to some level. Um, so a while loop is our first example of something. Uh, basically, a loop is a way to repeat a statement multiple times for pretty much as long as you need. So in this case, this while loop says, hey, as long as this expression is true, if expression is true, I want you to run that statement. 
And then, after I'm done running that statement, see if the expression is still true. And if it is, go ahead and run that statement again. And it's going to keep doing that. It's going to keep running that statement over and over and over again until expression is false. As soon as expression goes to false, it doesn't run that statement anymore and just goes to the exit. Okay? Does that make sense? Like that explanation for like how this loop works? So this while loop here, and I'll show I'll, I'll step into it a little bit because I think it becomes a little bit more clear when you see it running. So the key is that this is a lot like an if statement. If you just got rid of while and just put if, it's kind of the same thing. Think of this like an if statement that repeats over and over again. Okay? Like after it's done running a statement, it just starts over again and keeps running. So a while loop is like a a variant of an if statement that runs for as long as you need. Okay, here we go. Okay, while loops um, break easily. Break? You mean like? Like uh, make the game crash or make whatever you need crash. <laughs> Sometimes actually you just <laughs> ran into that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yes, it, it, there's a way that you can run a while loop that basically causes your game to never finish. Uh, I'll show you an example here. I'm actually not going to use this example. This, this is actually not a great example. <laughs> yeah. Um, so while loop is this followed by a statement. This looks a lot like if, right? It's so like if true, see out. Uh, maybe it's like you gained level. That. So what will that will that run? Will that spit out? Yes. You gained a level. Okay. If I just write that if statement, then replace this if with a while. So, going back to my explanation of what a while loop does, the first thing a while loop does is says, hey, is that statement true? It is, right? Mm -hmm. Run that block of code, which is everything from 12, 10 to 12. Cool. OK, then start over again. Is that statement true? So it's going to loop forever. That's right. It's going to loop forever. So this is what you get as the output? <laughs> yes. It's gonna so, so it's actually spitting. It's running forever. Why? Why is it running forever? Yeah, it's never never false. It's always true. What if I do the opposite? Well, what happens in this case here? Remember, just while loop is kind of like an if statement. Just think of it like an if statement. Does that run that line of code? No. No? Okay, what if I change it to a while? Yeah, it shuts off right away. It doesn't even run that code. It's just like an if statement, right? Okay, so you guys understand that that's, that's how the loop works, right? Uh, this gets really fun when you start changing variables inside of a loop to change how often the loop runs. Okay. So let's go to the actual example here. This is using the character type. Remember, a character in C++ is a single letter. To represent a single letter, you need to use these single quotes. Okay. Let's focus on this right here. The while again equals equals to y. So is this true? Can you tell me if that's true? Forget about the fact that it says while. What if it said if? Here. Don't get caught up on this. Just do this. So what's actually happening here? I have a variable called again is equal to y. So is that statement true? Right? Yes, right? It is true. So what happens when something is true in an if statement? It runs the code inside of the if statement, right? So it runs this. What is this code doing, though? It's, saying, it's printing out some stuff here. Notice he's using slash n. Um, then it asks for the input from the player. Do you want to play again, yes or no? OK. If I change this to be a while loop, like we talked about, after I type in that input, let's say I type in y. We go up to the top, again, will be equal to that, and I'll run that block of code again. So if I run this, every time I type in the letter Y, it runs this, right? Let me show you how this works internally. So I type in Y, I type in Y, I'm going to type in like H here, and it stops because it doesn't, you don't actually need to type in N here. So let me put a breakpoint here, and let's, let's step through this and figure out what it's actually doing. Okay. The yellow arrow is out 10. So it's like, OK, imagine this is an if statement. Where is it going to go? Where does that arrow go next? Where, where would it go in an if statement? Where would that arrow go if that statement were true? It would go to 12, right? OK, so yeah, it goes to 12. Not anything crazy. It's the same exact thing. It just goes to 12. Then it goes to 13. OK, then it goes to 14. 
Okay. So I get to type in a letter. I'll type in Y. Oops, I don't get to type in a letter yet. I'll type in Y. So I typed in Y there. So it's on 15 now. Where is it going to go? Back to 12? Not quite. It's going to go back to 10. It's going to go back to 10 first. It's going to reevaluate that. Okay. It goes all the way back to 10 first. <coughs> Runs it from the top. Runs it from whatever is at the top of this. Okay. Is that statement true or false? Yes. True. So, okay, so it runs that code. You guys see the pattern here? Okay. So I get to type in a letter again. I'm going to type in no this time. Now that I typed in no, where's the arrow going to go to? 17. No. Where does it, I typed in no, but where does it go after here? All the way back up. Even though I typed in something, where does this go? It has to figure out if it's true or false or not. Every time at the end of this, at a while loop, it will always go back to here before it figures out where to go next. Okay. I typed in a letter. It's the first thing it does is like, okay, well he typed in something new. I'm going to restart my loop. Should I restart my loop or not? Where's it going to go now after line ten? Seventeen. Seventeen. Sure. Okay. Is that clear, everyone? How that works? Right. So. The way a while loop works is it's always going to run this. You know, when going from 9, it goes to 10. That's pretty clear, right? Yeah. Then it runs whatever's in here if this is true, right? Every time, no matter what you do inside that code, no matter what you write inside of this statement here, no matter what you had done, doesn't matter, could be nothing, it will, <coughs> at the end of this curly brace, it will always jump up to 10, no matter what. No matter what. I guaranteed you will go to 10 after you're done writing it once. It's only after you go to run this line does it figure out whether it needs to go to a 12 or 15. Okay, you have to run this line to figure out whether you go inside here or whether you go inside here. So what is this going to do here? If I just left it like this, what does it do? So if I run this code, so there it is. Where does it go after this? It would go into 12, right? So if I do like C out hi. Okay, so it goes to 12. Where does it go after this? Where does it go after this? I'm on 12 right now. Where's it going to jump to after this? Where does it always go after running that block of code? It goes to 13, and then where does it go here? It goes to 10. So watch, 12, 13. So see how it's always going back to 10? I'm running 12, 13, always goes back to 10. So I'm actually just going to hold this down, right? So the order is, though, it does 10 first. It figures out whether it needs to go inside of it or not. So think of this again. It's just an if statement. I can do this by hand, actually. I'll show you how a loop works by hand, because you can actually run it, because I can use Visual Studio. OK, so tell me where this thing goes. It's an if statement. It goes to 12, right? Where does it go after this? 15. But I can actually change it to run there instead. I just, I just ripped it apart. I just abducted it from running line 15. I put it back up to 10. Cool. So it runs 12. No, you're not allowed to run number 15. Go here. Okay. So that's basically what it looks like if I were to do an if statement. Okay. So should I go inside there or not? Yes. Where does it go after this? Goes back up. Now, where does it go? Is this true or false? That's still true, right? I didn't change it. It's always true. Goes to 12. Cool. Is this true or false? Still true. It's all good. Um, okay, so let's let's see what it looks like. Okay. So even though I typed in the variable here, it always has to go back to the top of the loop before it evaluates what it's going to do next. All right. What would happen if I did this? Yep, 
exactly. Remember, this is just an if statement. Again, as n, the first thing it tries to do is compare to see if that value is equal to y or not. And you guys know what happens if I don't do this right. This loops forever. We already talked about that. Y is never changed. Like that, that variable, again, never changes. It's set once, it never changes. So this thing will repeat as long as the variable, again, is equal to Y. <coughs> you guys want some more examples of this stuff? Let me show you another example. Let's use an integer. How many times this thing is going to loop? <laughs> it's a trick question. Forever. Trick question. It's forever. Why is it forever? Because you don't have a C in. Yeah, I don't have a C in. But also, I'm not experienced. Well, really, it's because experience is always equal to zero. Yeah. So, what I can do, remember the plus plus operator? What does that do again? It just, it just adds one, right? It's going to do it a thousand times, exactly. So if I run this now, and bam, done. What if I replace this with an if statement again? Just does it once, right? Okay. What if I do this equal to 1,200 here? How many times is that going to loop? Once. Replace the wa with an if statement and tell me that answer again. How many times does that, that run? Zero. Zero times. How many times does the while loop run? Zero. Who said one? <laughs> it's zero. Same thing. It's the same exact behavior. The difference between a while loop and an if statement is that the while loop will repeat over and over. OK, here's, here's a question for you. How many times will this run? I heard zero. I heard twice. Both of those are wrong. It'll be one. It definitely runs at least once because experience is less than one. OK, so let's step through this. Let's figure out what actually happens here. OK, experience right now. What is experience equal to? Zero. Is experience less than one? Yes. OK, so where do I go? I go into 12, right? Cool. I'm going to add one to experience now. All right, experience has one added to it. You know what? If I hover over this guy, that experience is now what? What is experience equal to? One. Okay, where does this line of code go? Ten. Okay, now is that statement true? No. No. So where does it go? Sixteen. Right. It exits. All right. That's how that's how loops work. All right. So let me give you guys another uh, another challenge. How many times does this run? Now it runs twice. Why? Because that condition now includes one as a valid value. Okay. What about how many times does that run? I subtract one from experience every time. Forever. Forever. Or equivalently forever. Because it starts at zero and just starts counting downwards, and that loop will always be true. I feel like you guys understand a little bit more. You guys want more examples of this? I have more if you want. You want? No, you guys are good? Because I'm going to give you guys homework on this. I'll do one more example. Anyone tell me what 
tell me off the top of their head how many times this will run? Ten, Ten times? Well, it's I'm gonna say nine. Yeah. Nine. What is it doing? It's taking oh, the yeah. bounds. Yeah. So when it gets to a hundred, well, this is the easy way to find out. It's taking experience and bouncing. So how many times does this run? Once. Once. Right. Which means it's gonna go in here, spit out a hundred XP, and then exit. So it's gonna spit out a thousand, nine hundred, eight hundred, seven hundred, six hundred, five hundred, four hundred, three hundred, two hundred, one hundred. So it's 10, so you're right. <laughs> so yeah, that should be right. I, I wasn't counting 1,000 as one result. But this should be 1. Currently I have 100. It's going to subtract 1, go back up to here. Is 0 greater than, uh, greater than 0? No. Nope, so it jumps to here. Cool. Yeah, even I get these wrong sometimes. So I just put the breakpoint here and just let it run. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I should have known it for now. 10 times. OK. That's a while loop. Let's go into the, uh, the final bit. <laughs> Once you learn a while loop, a for loop is kind of the same thing. You can, too hard for me to learn. Really? Yeah. They're basically the same. Um, it's just remembering the eyes and all that. Like I have it now, but. So a do while loop, it's the same thing as a while loop. However, when it evaluates that expression is different. So a while loop evaluates it first before it does anything. A do while loop evaluates it at the end, after it's done everything. Okay? So remember, a while loop sees if it's true, and then does a statement. A do while loop just flips that order. It says, hey, do the statement first, and then see if that statement is true or not. Does that make sense? People, you just basically, remember how I said it always goes back up to the top of the while loop, and then sees if it's true? Well, this thing runs whatever it needs to, and then sees if it's true at the bottom. What that actually means is that you're guaranteed to run that statement at least once, every time. Right? So a do while loop is useful for when you need to run something at least once, no matter what happens. Right. You always want to run something once. Um, good example of this, let me think here for a second. Oh, here's another example. Like, let's say you're playing a Pokemon game. Poison damage. Yeah, or poison damage. Or like, let's say you both, uh, let's say you're trying to figure out, yeah, you're, you're taking poison damage. But in addition to taking poison damage, you also recoil that damage back to whoever poisons you. So. Uh, even though you're going to take poison damage, you always want to deal recoil damage to the person no matter what. Let's say you're, let's say even after you're dead, let's say you, you have zero health, even on zero health, you want to at least make sure that uh, countered recoil damage takes place. So a do while loop will guarantee that you run your statement. So maybe the statement here is like, hey, uh, counter whatever damage I do, um, whatever damage I take with my own damage, and then see if I'm dead or not. Like it might be do this stuff and then see if I'm dead. Which is very different than if I'm if I'm dead or if I'm sorry if I'm alive do this stuff. So the difference here. Let's just imagine this expression was: Hey, is the player dead? Sorry, is the player alive? That's a better one. Is the player alive? If the player is alive, then do this stuff here. Okay, cool. If the player is alive, then do damage like he's attacking, which is different than is the player alive being down here. This is says: Hey, he could be dead right here. He could actually be dead by the time you run the statement, but it's still gonna run it. You get down to here and then finally figure out if he's alive or dead. So the way that you, uh, the reason why you do this is because you wanna guarantee that this loop runs at least once. So the, the other, other uh, interesting bit is that this while loop has a semicolon at the end of it. So keep that in mind, there's a little bit of a, can uh, foil you. Let me show you what that looks like. So, okay, so let's use this as an example. This is our while loop. How many times does this loop run in this case? I don't know. Zero times? Yeah, zero. It's zero. It never runs that stuff inside of it because experience is greater than equal to zero. 
So I'm just going to move this guy here. Put a semicolon in front of it. Do. Now, how many times does this thing run? Once. That's it. Let's, let's step through this code here. Let's use that debugger. So first thing it does, I put a debug breakpoint at 10. It immediately jumped into 12. It's like, ah, tell me later whether I should run or not. It's just going to go ahead and run at least once. Now where does it go? Here, from 14. It goes to 16. Right. OK, currently have 0. I move that. What will that print out here now? Negative 100. Negative 100. OK. Let's step through this. So what will the first thing that prints out be? Someone said 900. That's right. Is this statement true? Yeah. Where does it go then? Back up to 10, right? Well, 10 and then it jumps into line number 12. It doesn't actually need to run line number 10 because it's just line number 10 just says go to number 12 anyway. So we're going to repeat this. Let's see. 10 times. This time I did count it right. It's different though. That prints 900, 800, 700, 600, 500. Because you moved the. Yeah, because I moved that. <coughs> so I do this, print it out. 1,900, 800, 700. But again, the difference is that this is guaranteed to run at least once. The, the result is the same. But the difference is that if this is 0, it still prints out zero like that. If this was just a regular old while loop, if I just put it back to what it was before, like that, I don't get into that loop at all. It actually skips over this completely. All right, so that's while loops. Do while loops. These are pretty common. I'll get into more of um, how to combine multiple conditions, as well as probably if, if uh, for loops. I'd like to get into functions next week, too. But let me, uh, let me give you guys the homework, because you do have homework. There's only two problems this time, but don't let that deceive you. Just because there's two problems, the second one is uh, may, may or may not make you So the first question is kind of an, it's not really an advanced version. It's, again, kind of a review question from last week. So I want you to type in inches and spit out to the screen how many feet and inches that is. Okay. Does this make sense? So if I type in 71, which is my height, you should see 5 feet 11 inches. If I typed in 70 inches as my height, I should say 5 feet 10 inches. If I typed in 72, I should see 6 feet 0 inches. Okay. I give you guys a hint. You've got to use the modulus operator, percent operator. So look it up if you're not sure what it does. But the modulus operator will return you the remainder, the what's left over, after the division operation. So what is 71 mod 2 or 12? I say it right there. 11. That seem to make sense there? So 71 mod 12 is 11. That's 11 inches. So that's what I want you to write. Okay. That's how you break apart something that is into feet and inches, right? You ever, you ever have someone tell you, like, oh, I'm like 120 or I don't know how many centimeters tall I am, 180 centimeters tall, how many, like, meters or feet and inches that is? You can also do that with this. But that's not the homework. The homework is just give me inches, spit out feet and inches. 
Just be lucky I'm not asking you to do it the other way around. Um, it's not that much harder, but this I think is easier. Okay, number two. So you're making a game. Unfortunately, your hero has uh, been afflicted with poison. You guys have any play? Anyone play Darkest Dungeon? Yeah. 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 Okay. You're stressed out. Um, <laughs> you have been afflicted by poison, and you will eventually die. You're guaranteed to die. This game sucks. It's life. We don't have antidotes. It's a roguelike. So I want you to write a loop. So you're going to have the player type in how much health they have. You're going to write a loop that subtracts 12 health from our player. And let's spit it up. Okay. Spit out the current health that they have, and when they die, since your hero has died. This is using a while loop. You will be using a while loop to do this. Okay? Yes? Oh, I'll put this up on Zool real fast. Thanks. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I'll stop recording.